Hello, everybody. Hello again for this session with Clara Kofosa. Good uh, night, Clara. <laughs> um, so um, Clara is a Filipino graphic designer, and we're unsure if she is the first Filipino to present at a Taipei. I know we have a few American friends from Filipino descent, but it could be this is the first Filipino presenter, which is hello. Great to have you inaugurate the Philippines in a, at Itapai conference. So you're founder of a Tipong Filipino, Filipino, an incubator for Filipino type design and typography. When when did you start this? In 2019 also. So also in 2019. That's when you were the first yeah. recipient of the Mali Scholarship for Women of Color in the Type Design field. Which is great, and you're writing on 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 Filipino graphic design. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you do that academically, or is there some online presence where you do this? Um, no, actually, it's still, it's still a work in progress. I'm not, I'm not um, currently with any academic body, okay. but doing it independently as of now. It's okay. great. Well, we're getting exclusive sneak peeks over here. Yeah. <laughs> Very still work out. Okay. So uh, I guess everybody who wants to join, who wanted to join, has joined. So uh, let's say, uh, take it away, Clara. And we're uh, looking forward for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, greetings. <laughs> I will. Right. Thank you. Okay. Mabuhay. Greetings. I am Clara Cayosa and I'm joining you today from Cebu, Philippines. So just before I start my presentation, I'd like to give a few disclaimers. My advanced apologies if my internet lags. Our connection here in the Philippines is notoriously known to be faulty. Um, I also initially thought that the submission to the forum for the speakers was for internal purposes. And so the title you saw earlier uh, would be, was, you know, sounded a bit too academic, I think. Uh, but in this presentation, everything is mostly observations from the things that I've gathered on my own and um, research and things that were sent to me by my colleagues and uh and this is how i piece them all together into a story arc of everything and anything filipino time so yes i am the founder of tipong filipino an incubator exploring filipino type design and typography but before striking out on my own i worked with a manila-based design studio where i design and strategize on brand identity projects and other graphic design commissions Apart from my work for Tipong Filipino, my practice involves mainly um, custom typefaces and brand identity systems. So I didn't really start out as a type designer. I actually did a lot of brand identity uh, work. But uh, in 2020, during the first quarter of the pandemic, I had the honor of being the first recipient of the Mali Scholarship by the good people of Sharp Type Co. It's a scholarship to advance and empower women who are part of underrepresented racial and ethnic groups in the type design field. Through this scholarship, I received financial assistance, creative mentorship, and professional guidance that shaped me to who I am now, speaking in front of an international audience. And unfortunately, here in the Philippines, we currently don't have universities or institutions that have programs for type design or even just mechanisms that provide support for research and scholarly discourse on anything graphic design related. Because of the lack of written history on Filipino graphic design too, the general notion of being a graphic designer in the Philippines is that it isn't a legitimate occupation to have. For the longest time, the designation graphic designer, graphic artist, layout artist, and print technicians are all jumbled up together. Clearly, there are still a lot of gaps that need to be filled for design literacy. It is also a challenge to explain the importance of analyzing and talking about graphic and type design, especially in a third world country where we still face numerous bigger problems such as poverty and prevailing corruption. 
Nonetheless, I continue my self-initiated efforts researching and writing on Filipino graphic design with the help of my friends uh, and exploring the intersections of graphic design, art, and national identity. And I do everything Filipino graphic and type design through Tipong Filipino. So Tipong Filipino, again, um, it's an incubator for anything Filipino type design and typography. So how it started. Digital font making in the Philippines has been popular lately. Tipong Filipino started out initially as an exhibit in 2019 in the historical street of Escolta in Metro Manila, the capital of the country. It was the first of its kind. My co-organizer, Vince Africa, and I got a few design studios to design typefaces with the Filipino context in mind, letting Filipino cities and values influence letter forms and other designs. It was well received by the local creative community and the popularity of Filipino type, not just from the designers, but from the general public. The exhibit prompted more dialogues on these types. So, so actually this year, what we did was we hosted a mentorship program, a month long mentorship program last August. And we did it in partnership with Japan Foundation Manila who granted us a financial assistance. And uh, we had a speaker from Morisawa in Inc., um, the uh, foundry in Japan. and um, we had them as a keynote speaker to talk about Japanese type culture and design. Uh, because of Japan Foundation Manila, we were able to provide these, uh, the mentorship program for young type designers for free. Like we didn't have to join uh, with, a, with a fee. So we had over 20, 27 participants and four mentors. This is the keynote presentation that uh, Keitaru Sakamoto gave uh, all about their work in, in Morisawa and Japanese type design. So just showcasing some of the works uh, made by our now type designers. So the prompt here was that we asked them to focus on the refinement of letters uh, because that was something that we saw was lacking in the in the budding type community here in the Philippines is that everyone is trying to create new alpha, uh, new character sets uh, and and see them and and complete complete character sets but then they weren't there wasn't much attention given to each letter uh, that was made and so in this case in the in the mentorship program what we did was we asked the participants to choose one let one word that was either uh, that, that was of a Filipino language and use that word to inspire uh, the the design of the letter form and they were required to finish the entire character set in a month what we asked them was to finish the the word the word itself um and so it was a it was a very fulfilling program and we hope to do it again next year if there's any funding <laughs> so salamat is thank you in filipino i'd like to thank atipai for having me this is a special opportunity to talk about type from the philippines i know that as an organization atipai has had research as as, as at its heart with inclusivity as one of the current threats. Events like this conference allow for its discussions and research and encourage independent researchers like me to continue on. This is especially motivating for the Philippines where there has been little research and archival work on graphic and type design. So I'm really grateful. This is also very exciting for me since it's my first time to not just present but also participate as an audience. 
unfortunately, I, I never had the opportunity to take part in the past because of time and financial constraints. Truly, ATIP I is becoming more inclusive than ever. When, when designing letter forms or just working with bodies of text, I often find myself reflecting on the significance of all of this, type design and typography. It's hard not to ponder on this, whether or not type should be, should have this much attention, especially in contrast again to third world problems that we face in the Philippines. But again, it's hard to imagine a world without type or even language, because language are the first identity marks of any given culture. Everything that concerns language, speech, gestures, or signs, or anything verbal, and including its form, the writing, or even the type design, thus are of prime importance in defining who we are as nations. It is through language that nations can transmit the values that they stand for. This is also, I think, precisely why the promotional poster for this international event features all over in different languages. Each time a word is translated to a different language, it either adds another dimension or slightly alters the meaning. So sometimes, you know, that's why there's a, re there's a, there's a saying, things get lost in translation. Uh, for example, taking the translation of welcome, uh, when, we visit, when we welcome a visitor in the Philippines, we exclaim mabuhay. In, in English, the word welcome means a desired guest, but for the Filipino counterpart, mabuhay, it literally means to be alive, similar to Espanol's, the Espanol's viva. We're not just acknowledging that you are a visitor, we're also exclaiming that you should either live here or be alive when you find yourself in any of the Philippine islands. This translation of a single word already expounds on the fact that we always want visitors to have the best time in our country. Generally considered the greatest Filipino hero, Dr. Jose Rizal prized the humanizing effect of language. He says, man is multiplied by the number of languages he possesses and speaks. Rizal himself was said to be fluent in 22 world, world languages, including German, Dutch, and Russian, and other local languages. He translated also works from German to Tagalog and wrote about language and linguistics. Language is such an everything that when we start speaking and thinking in a foreign language, it changes, it's like changing lenses. And so to celebrate, uh, including the Philippines in the picture of the eye of all over, I'm using the many ways to translate all over in Filipino to structure the rest of my presentation. Um, I was going to ask if anyone has gone to the Philippines. Um, I don't know if there's a way I could see if the, the, there's a quick show of hands. If yes, say yes. Or at least if you know anyone who is uh, Filipino. <laughs> because the Philippines, um, if you don't know uh, where we are, it's in Southeast Asia. The Philippines is an archipelagic country that spreads us Filipinos into different barangays or villages, municipalities, provinces, regions, islands, and island groups. Our country is a country beaming with various flavors, stones, and sensibilities. We're also known for our fiestas, always a burst of contrasting colors. And it, for me, it feels like my country is a microcosm within a mi macrocosm. Uh, because we don't just end in the Philippines, we always expand towards the rest of the world. And I, the first part here is kahit saan, which means anywhere or everywhere in the world. So we're all over the world. Uh, because anywhere you go in the world, chances are there's a breathing Filipino community. Much like our heroes or illustrados, Filipinos fly out of the country for more opportunities abroad in the hopes of providing better lives for their families. Apart from the general trend of globalization, I think another reason why there are many Filipinos who, have, who are able to work abroad is because of our profic proficiency in English. But if you ask me one word that could encapsulate the Philippines, I would say it's variety. Just by looking at language alone, you, you get to see how varied my country is. Aside from our national, lang national language Filipino, the standardized form of Tagalog, our country has different languages, such as Visaya, Ilocano, 
Ilongo, Ibanag, Siligaynon, Chabahano. I think some of our participants are from different regions of the Philippines. Um, so we, we, there's a variety of uh, words and languages, just even if we're just talking about the Philippines alone. Uh, just a few more um, facts about the the Philip about the Philippines, just so that you have a general idea. We the official Filipino alphabet includes 26 Latin letters with the additional Spanish ny and the ng uh, digraph of Tagalog. So the Philippines again is archipelagic in many senses, not just geographically. Philippine, Philippine islands don't live in a vacuum. They are both isolated and connected. This variety shouldn't be seen though as fragmented, um, but rather variety should be embraced. We have been colonized and corrupted by the West, by the East, and by our very own. <laughs> we Filipinos have adapted and assimilated to whatever we learn from the Spanish or American, such as the, you know, it's shown in the alphabet. Uh, Chinese or Japanese, but and because of these foreign influences that we've had in the past, we are left struggling to distinguish where influence ends and identity begins. Starting point is by buying a pre-colonial writing system from the Tagalog that's truly Filipino or devoid of any foreign influence. Uh, the Baybayin continues to exist even after the imposition of uh, Latin script by the Spanish by the Spanish colonizers. Uh, Baybayin originated from the Tagalog region, which literally means to spell. And so, in the past, it was already used by the Spaniards to push for, uh, Christianity. It was integrated to uh, the first book. Uh, that was ever printed here in the Philippines, the Doctrina Christiana. Christiana. Uh, but unfortunately, by buy-in was only integrated for Christianity use and not for other official documents of the colony at the time. It wasn't a widespread language across the country. It was only used, again, in specific Tagalog regions. But because by buy-in is pre-colonial and was used to represent also, revolutionary forces against the Spaniards, it has always been used to imprint Filipino myth. Now we see that Baybayan is having a resurgence because there is a great desire to preserve cultural memory. The popularity of Baybayan is starting to branch out of esoteric uses, seeping through the Filipinos every day. Last year, the administration of Manila included Baybayan translations to public signs and tourist spots. And this part local debate and conversation whether or not it should be integrated and supported further as the official Filipino script. But using by buying as a powerful representation of our being Filipino isn't new. Numerous government agencies, logos, and seals have used have included by buying characters to again add the Filipino element to it. So some a few examples would be the National Museum which has the symbol for pa, the first syllable of pamana or inheritance. And even uh, the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, the seal features the stylized ka, the, the symbol that stands for kadakilaan. And Cultural Center of the Philippines also has the same symbol for ka and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines over here on the bottom right. So again, the general, idea is if you want to make a flag or still look Filipino, you add it by buying character. That's, that's what's happening right now. Um, even also in the passport, in the redesign of the passport and the our, our banknotes, you see uh, some by buying script of a, a passage from the Bible and the banknotes with uh, by buying for Filipino. So in the Philippines, the verbal again is taken into account in various endemic languages like by buying and, and endemic scripts have current preservation efforts. But visually, but visually speaking, what makes type look visually Filipino? 
Because again, we know that text isn't just something that is read, it's also something that can be seen. Uh, in the same way that image can be read and uh, can be seen and also can be read. So again, what makes uh, what makes a particular type look Filipino? This desire to pinpoint what makes anything what makes anything visually Filipino isn't new. Uh, I find myself nodding while reading this quote, which asks the question questions like. How can we be proud of ourselves if we have no identity? We have no Angkor Wat or Taj Mahal. Like, who are we? Um, but I'm slapped by the fact that this was from a speech of a late dictator, Ferdinand Marcos. Uh, he gave this as, it's part of his rational form when he declared martial law in the country. Sadly, in the Philippines, it took a dictator in power to give this much importance to developing the arts and culture because really the arts were thriving during the dictator's time, but unfortunately in an abrasive, ostentatious, and immoral way. And also at the cost of overlooking human rights and sustainable solutions against poverty. This is Marcos when he arrived in Washington and he always knew the importance of putting a good image towards foreigners, packaging the Philippines into the Bagong Lipunan or new society. You, know, you can see even here, just through type, his administration wanted to proclaim this image or this facade that the Philippines was so sure of its identity. Um, I really like this photo because it showcases uh, well, Ferdinand Marcos, but also the seal of the office of the president at the time, because he actually redesigned it from First, it was called the seal of uh, the office of the president, and it was in English written in this serif font. Uh, and then later on, was Philippine uh, translated to Filipino. But during Marcus's time, he just changed the font um, of the text into this Baybayin like script, this Filipino folk style, and he used this um, same font. Uh, for his massive rebranding and repackaging of the nation to the Bagong Lipunan or the New Society. This Filipino folk font was used not just as an image for the Philippines, but also for his propaganda purposes, shaping, shaping the image of the Marcoses as the mother and father of the Pearl of the Orient. And you can see here, he, he applied the style on Latin, um, Latin text instead of, say, using uh, the pre-colonial by buy-in writing. And during this performative bit of essentialist nationalism that prioritizes aesthetics over any actual meaningful attempt at building awareness of our history or dialoguing with our identity, Marcus's administration hard push for the by buy-in or Filipino folk style, as I call it now, uh, made by buying merely for aesthetic purposes. Now, this started a trend. Um, so again, instead of the actual by buying characters, they used the same brush stroke, uh, and it was integrated to uh, Latin uh, letters. And so these are just some tourism, uh, tourism paraphernalia from the past. And you can see the trend. For with Philippines, whenever it's the Philippines is included, it's in this particular folk style. So these are some tourism uh, posters. And even also when you're talking about music or the arts, the same style was applied so basically anything that was about the philippines or wanted to project this philippine image had this particular style so it made me wonder like where where does the inspiration come from aside from by buying so another another observation or um uh another another thing that i assume is that 
they took inspiration also from the Sari Manok, or roughly translated uh, to the creature, uh, the bird or chicken of assorted colors. Um, the, I think this is a prime example of combining the two points of uh, the Filipino folk style and the Sari Manok. The Far Eastern University has this Filipino folk style text uh, and a coat of arms and a Sari Manok motif because the university wanted to have a Filipino touch in everything that they did because they were one of the first universities at the time to be founded by a Filipino in, in Manila, in the Philippines. And so again, like from the past, it, this is already this is already a trend that was brewing up, and actually even until now, uh, we see this around the Philippines, um, regardless of what island group you're in. No re regime regime has more blatantly used tourism policy for political leverage than the Mar than Marcos. He established the Ministry of Tourism, which prompted the government agency to package the Philippines into this idyllic, musty, oriental destination, making a legitimizing martial law and making it appear that martial law was necessary for the country to be this beautiful. This is a, this is a scan from their first tourism campaign, Philippines, where Asia wears its smile. It's not necessarily following the Filipino folk trope, but nonetheless, has exudes that same feeling of light and smooth and uh, very suave calligraphic oriental type yes. because that's really what they wanted to be to do it's easy going and it's very soft for the eyes to look at and they really wanted to exude this feeling of a land of sunny living of uh, feeling like living in a dream in the islands of imagination and we see this recurring, we see the same style applied on um, Mabuhay, Mabuhay magazine, which is the Philippine Airlines, the flag, the, 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 the flag courier airlines of the Philippines, uh, which is also a loyalty, loyalty um, card. Uh, and, and it had the exact same style as uh, the tourism campaign, Philippines. So again, looking at the consistency in the use of the Filipino folk font style during this time, and even examples such as this, the Marcos administration tried to homogenize the Philippine image. But again, this a singular cultural identity for an archipelago of 7,000 islands is just impossible. It doesn't let all the variety of colors and cultures shine in all their glory. So we can never we can never have a solid identity like the Swiss because the Philippines is just always bursting with different flavors. In that case, we're all over the place. We're kalat. So another translation of all over is kalat, which can also mean disorder or mess. But this doesn't mean that kalat is bad um, because when you're talking about Filipino type. What I noticed was that we don't really bother distinguish lettering or anything made with hands from the digital type design. Categorizing types into mediums is a Western practice that seems to have no place here, where digital and traditional go hand in hand. This is Kubao Free. It was made by Aaron Amar, a digital render of the letters found in signboards typically displayed in windshields of jeepneys, SUVs, buses and other transport vehicles within and outside the metro. It has it has three widths. Um, and just like the original placards, the typeface is designed to fill words or root destination names in a rectangular space, mostly paired with bright neon colors and black background for readability. Uh, this was made in 2018. It remains to be one of the uh, popular Filipino made points. Our country's local visual landscape is very typographic. It's on transportation, it's on ice cream carts, and it's on bankas or boats. Uh, I suggest that you follow this type, uh, this account. It's Urban Type Davao, who does an excellent job in documenting the art signs that adorn Davao City, a metropolis in Mindanao, a southern, the southern part of the Philippines. Just a few more examples of brush lettering. 
found in uh, buses and other modes of transportation. I think we really have this rich culture of type because Filipinos are very fond of personalizing or even just adding text to objects, home facades, gates. Uh, this is a side of a jeepney. Uh, jeepney drivers have the freedom to customize their rides and add whatever quote or name of their daughter or son uh, or any phrase that they want to include in on their jeepney. There are really so many interesting aspects of type that Filipino type that are worthy of analysis. But given the limited time, my focus will be on the two modes of slow typography, uh, local art science and marks on in a bell weaving. So let's start first with. So uh, city, cities in the Philippines, both rural and urban, are again adorned by let letters. Uh, lettering here in the Philippines, we call it art sign making, uh, contribute a lot to the visual landscape of the Philippines. But as with other traditional practices, this phenomenon is facing a decline because of instant and more economical options such as tarpaulin printing. More business owners and government agencies who are typically the clientele of these art sign painters uh, favor tarpaulin printing and other um, digital and digital printing because it requires less people, it's economical, and printed in an instant. Uh, it's obviously beat manual labor. And that's why I really appreciate the work of uh, Clara Balaguer. Her name is also Clara. Uh, she's been doc documenting um, the, the, this tradition of uh, art sign making and compiled them in a research book called Filipino Folk Foundry, explaining in length why handmade sign lettering should be also considered a form of typography. I included some slides of uh, some spreads. So handmade signs on walls and gates aren't just letters and words. It's really, it's the art of Filipino lettering is of cultural significance and government agencies or creative individuals like me have to step up to make sure that these aren't just these just doesn't this these letters don't disappear. So these are just some photos also taken by um, Clara Balaguer's team. Local sign makers don't make much here in the Philippines, despite their tremendous skills and background. What I what I when I tried to talk to some local art time paint makers in La Union and Cagayan Valley, like two other provinces, uh, what I realized is that they were also actually trained traditionally, like they were also graduates of art school. Uh, but why it really just makes me wonder why um, despite the labor intensive work they don't get paid as much. This is Lupo Ganaden, the local art sign maker of San Juan La Union. And um, last month, I took an apprenticeship with him uh, and learned how to expertly paint signs with, with, with or without bases. Uh, under his guidance, I painted my first, please do not block the driveway under the postal heat of um, San Juan La Union. But just like Aaron Amar, Lupo isn't just great at painting letters. He's also very well versed in font styles on his laptop, always referencing before heading out to paint on walls and gates and other signages. He uses Microsoft PowerPoint to lay out on his computer, remembering the most optimal chronolo chronology of words and letters. He doesn't own a printer, but sketches the guide through memory. And in an age where fast and instant is the default, there's an even deeper, deeper appreciation for anything slow, especially since anyone can turn outside these days. That's all because of the ease of, prefabric of selecting prefabricated fonts. This trend of having and creative, 
creating things instantly um, can be seen like with TikTok and Canva as applications that make it easier for people to create digitally. But in the Philippines, what I also realized was that a lot of the beauty from type design comes from the fact that it was made in a made slow uh, and slow typography is a human practice it utilizes the senses and enabling the lyric quality of a word to be more apparent it is the basis of creating brilliant typography and it brings out authenticity recognizing the value of the individual this next uh, this next medium that i'm about to talk about is in a bell weaving in the northern part of Luzon, uh, which uses the traditional wooden pedal frame looms. And I really like this uh, this type work here because it says, Yakapin ang kulay, or embrace your colors. So these are various um, photos of a bell. Um, Another way to call uh, these uh, weaving, uh, these products of weaving. When I visited Bangar, the blanket capital of northern Luzon, I came across this variety of towels and blankets. It's it. what I realized with these types on the on the blankets is that it was very nostalgic. I grew up with having these as um, my blankets at home. And uh, apart from that, like I just it made me think about how how much knowledge and um, patience is needed to create these letter forms through create through carefully crafting letter forms by hand and using our senses rather than only the abstract thinking of the head. The practice of slow typography reprivileges -priv re ways of physical and emotional knowing. I these are portions from uh, this article, this essay written by Veronica Grow about the importance of slow typography, and what I really like, what what I really like about all these Bangar blankets is that it really showcases. Um, it, it read the the design just shows how meticulously made, uh, how meticulous these letter forms are made. And um, I'll read another portion of uh, the slow typography. Slow typography involves learning to draw or make letters by hand, which nourishes mind, body, and spirit. Working with our hands is a uniquely engaging human experience that comes from being both creatively and physically active. And um, what's sad about the what's sad about the Bangar uh, with with with, with uh, the Bangar letter forms is that it's only done by one person in the in town. She is um, Manang Eli, who uh, the one encircled here, and she's the only surviving Tagamarca or the person in charge of including the type on the the on the fabric. Um, and it's amazing because she's a senior citizen, but she has the knowledge and the intricate hands, even the memory to remember the spacing between uh, letters and the the widths of the stems, all by memory. And because and and, and it's just unfortunate that no one else is um, focusing on preserving type the type portion of uh, these products because most of the conservation efforts uh, done by a lot of organizations are catered towards the patterns or the, the graphic part of the the product, but not if, if the, the type here is kind of like overlooked. Um, and so I guess like that's all that I have right now for Filipino type. And I'm just gonna share like a few realizations is that uh, for Filipino type, I think um, we the the default is uh, Filipino type is slow. Uh, art science or a bell weaving, it's 
constantly going against instant because I think it really connects us to our practices, to our to our practice, to our experiences, to even the community that we are um, surrounded by. And I think um, also for Filipino type and actually even just for graphic design in general, uh, we need to embrace a variety and locality. Um, again, not just not not just for Filipinos, but also for everyone else in the world. Uh, for the for for us Filipino graphic designers, I think we don't need to have whatever other first world or other global countries had in the past, or treat them as the basis or the standard. Uh, because we do tend to think that foreign is better or superior superior over our very own. I mean, we already did, did we tried to do that in the past couple of years, trying to make our cities look global. But you know, how, what what does global even look like? So again, we're kalat or all over in a lot of ways. But I guess instead of trying to reject that reality, I think we should. Us Filipinos have to embrace them. Uh, the variety of mediums, the variety of languages that adorn again our culture and our our way of living, and uh, because again the Philippines is archipelagic and there's really bound to be differences across regions and islands. And it's I think in harnessing the beauty of and the power of being varied and kalat uh, will be able to figure out more and more what makes a particular type or graphic design look Filipino. That is all that I have. Thank you again. Um, these are some of the points that I used on the slides and special thanks to some of my friends who helped me out here. And thanks again, ATPI, for having me and for letting me share my research, my ongoing research, and the things that I, uh, the Filipino, Philippines has um, for the inter, inter, entire world to see. So thank you. Thank you so much, Clara. That was really fascinating. It shows us a thing, a, a, a portion of topography that we're not uh, sufficiently aware of. So it was really eye-opening. I'm going to check if there are any questions. We have very little time left, I must say. There was a very expansive talk, which I thank you for, because it was super uh, like elaborate. But now I see uh, Raphael is asking, um, and it's a long question, so bear, bear with me. Now, how does one put into context the machines that we put letters in our media here? In one angle, it looks handmade, but on the other hand, it can look inefficient and unsystematic. Which which letters? Oh no, damn it! There's two questions. It's one. It's a follow-up. Sorry, I'm sorry. Ah, okay. Cool. So hold on. Gerrit Nurtse once stated that there is no essential difference between handwriting and typography. Fred oh, is that what I would say? Yeah. And then Fred Smyers, on the other hand, states that handwriting, calligraphy, and typography have little in common with each other, except that they use similar elements called letters. And then the continuation. Mm. Now, how does one put into context the machines that we put letters in our media here? In one angle, it looks handmade, but on the other hand, it can look inefficient and unsystematic. I think it's really a different case in the Philippines, in the Philippine context, because again, if you look at um, the the letters found on like transportation signs um, from afar, you can actually say that these letters aren't optimized for readability. Um, it, it's not. It, you can't see it from afar. You. Um, it, it, there are thin strokes over here, so it's really difficult to read. But what I realized is that um, in the Philippines, I think we don't really care so much about, you know, readability or the differences between all of these like categories in type design. That usually, again, like the reference to the question is even from, uh, I think, yeah, this is a like 
I know this is like a classic type book, <laughs> but uh, I, I think, yeah, again, going back, if you're here in the Philippines, parang, uh, I mean, people don't really care so much about that. And I think what happens is because we see this typical, say, for example, let's, let's take, for example, the, the placard, um, the destination placard, because we're so, we see it at a day to day basis. Um, and even if, like, objectively speaking, in a Western mindset, it looks, it does not look, it's not optimized to be readable from afar. Uh, for the Filipino eye, because we see it in a regular basis, it's understood and it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's readable, <laughs> if that makes sense. So, I mean, I think. I think what I'm trying to say here is that we need, it's probably nice to just see Filipino type without having um, background knowledge of how it was done in other countries because I think we haven't been really influenced in anything type related. I mean, we, I don't, I've been trying so hard to find out if there was any local font foundry that was established in the past but as of now we don't have one and I think this informal or vernacular type design is our type design here in the Philippines and so I, I, I wouldn't put that much importance into distinguishing those two. Another thing that I noticed, so when I look at the uh, Baibain scripts itself, so the shapes are very fluent and, and, and have many curls and so on. And when you show those vintage styles, you see that these characteristics have been applied to Latin type forms. Now, I know that there is this whole conversation uh, specifically in the US where um, Latin uh, typefaces mimic uh, the Chinese characters. And in the 70s, it had a very bad aftertaste because it was often um, kind of racist to be using those. And even recently, there mm -hmm. were, there were uh, T-shirts and posters that people denounced, like this is making fun of. So how do you see your vintage styles that also mimic the shapes, but in a Latin typeface? How do you see that in relation to, is it is it valid or is it trying to yeah mimic well in the case if it, it, it's about the by buying like the by buying script in this case actually actually in this particular sign mage system uh it's part of the debate because yes we do have a pre-colonial original way of writing but there are also a lot of um problems that um uh, or, or hurdles like one is that by buying wasn't widespread across the entire archipelago. It was just in a particular area. And so that's not inclusive. The second, it was, it, it kind of died down. And so a resurgence of this is, it, the resurgence of this script in, on, on signages and even in our, in our official documents, like it, it begs the question whether or not we're treating it as aesthetic. Um, but I think, uh, but then I think this is like the translating the style and putting it, integrating it to uh, the Latin type. I think it's valid um, because again, the Philippines were were we we write in the Latin script, um, unlike uh, our South, some of our Southeast Asian counterparts. Uh, we um, we we primarily work with we primarily write with Latin script and. Uh, we speak English. Uh, it's kind of like a second language. So I, I see this more of like adapting or like having those best of both worlds of like having a bit of Filipino touch, but also keeping up with what the current language is because that's, that's you know, that's, that's type, like the type for the now. And uh, yeah, so I, 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 I wouldn't say it's, it's taking advantage of of um uh, the past or uh it, it it's just it has a very colorful history but i think it's there's still a place for it here in the philippines and it's valid 
So what are your connotations when you see it now? Does it feel historical to you? Does it seem of that political era? Does it seem like what, what are your feelings if you see it out in the wild? The general, the, the general feeling is that it looks Filipino. Okay. Uh, it's, it's like classic Filipino. So this is actually like the political aspect of it was just something that I noticed on my own. And, and, mm -hmm. and that's why it's a bit tricky because I really, like I personally adore um, seeing all of these like brush script um, calligraphic looking uh, I, we you will see it when if you land in Manila you'll see it on some bus lines uh, they have the same style and and it's really it really feels an exude Filipino um but but yeah I think it's just good to note that it had a it had that history of being used for propaganda or um taking inspiration from pre-colonial icons mm -hmm. It's really beautiful, um, or just the formal elements of a lot of them. And I like how much diversity there is within this style. Like it feels, yeah, like there's still a lot of range in it. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's, it's very Filipino. I mean, that's really like, there was um, uh, Joey Alvear, one of a, a graphic designer in the Philippines. He, he shared me some of these photos. And he presented them also uh, in 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 an online in an online talk, and he called it the classic Filipino style. So that made me think. I'm like, what makes it classic? You know, where did it where did this start? Like, how did this happen? How did it become classic? So yeah, th those are just all my interpolations. Like, uh, we'll see. I I have yet to gather more information um where where, where how this all starts in yeah this okay. is wonderful yeah this was a really great talk and i was really excited to see how much uh just all of the range and it gives me a lot to think about and i feel like i have a lot more questions and things i want to talk about and if other people in this room as well want to keep the conversation going i encourage everyone to move over to the hangout room then we can see your faces as well, and we can get deeper into these topics, and you can talk directly with Clara. Yeah, all right. So Clara, thank you so much for your presentation, and everybody move over to the Hangout Room. We're gonna stop here, okay? Thank all you right. very much. We'll Bye -bye. see you over there.